Evolution does play a big part in these. Exactly, I mean, are, yes. are we talking in your work about new animals or animals that have evolved from other animals or animals that have interbred? Well, the, the interbreeding, that's hybridization, and usually that's mm. a dead end because most hybrids are sterile. There are a few um, f uh, fertile ones, but they're usually sterile the next generation in any case. But usually it's animals that are, like the Vukrang ox, totally new. They're just a one-off. Or it's others that are, can be quite similar, but for some genetic reason are very different. All such animals like um, the coelacanth, which is a, a an ex supposedly extinct type of fish we discovered, they're the last of a line that believed to have died out long ago. And mm. One, for some reason, or they somehow survived to the present day. So there's a variety of different ones. You know, you can get quite a range of new and rediscovered animals. And we've got some more pictures of other ones. Let's go to Australia uh, for this next one, which is the scaly-tailed possum. Now this one is a classic example of the natives know all about it. They mm. called it the wilder. And when it was discovered, the Aborigines said basically, well, you know, so what? We've always known about this. But it took ages. It was found in 1917. The first one was captured alive in 1919 at the centre of Perth Zoo. Then nothing turned up until about the 1940s. Then a single one in the 1950s, a single one in the 1960s. You know, in, in literally about five decades, only four had turned up. And the Aborigines said, well, basically, you're looking in the wrong area. This mm. is where you need to look. And the population, for reasons we still don't know why, but they, it fluctuates. Some years it's very rare, almost extinct. Other mm. years there are lots of them. And that was one, if we'd have taken notice of the Aboriginal people, we would have found it and known more about it a lot earlier than we do. How important is it for us to know about these animals? Well, the point is that they all have their own ecological niche. They're all, they, they all here literally for a biological purpose. They would have died out if they weren't successful. And it's amazing the type of things that can be found out from these animals. I mean, all sorts of even medical discoveries have been found out from some of them. So mm. we don't know. It's the case of if we lose them, it's too late to, to think, well, what, what, what could we have found out? It's too, once they're gone, the old saying, extinction is forever, short of Jurassic Park techniques. It is but I, I, how much, because you bought this, this, this creature, which yeah. is which is, there we go, have a look at him there. And that is? That is what was used to be known as Brontosaurus, but the scientists have changed their mind. We're now calling it a Patasaurus. A Patasaurus? Yeah. And that's a pat on the Backosaurus. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> it's, oh. a, it's all the old gags, isn't it? Yes. What, do they call, what, 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 what do they call one of these with one eye? I don't know, but I've got a feeling you're going to tell me. Do you think you saw, do you think you saw us? <laughs> Oh, sorry, Agnes. Let's, let's, sorry, I'll let, I'll let that settle in for a little while. Yes, uh, I'm, yes. I'm, being, I'm going to be serious now. Um, creatures like that, I mean, what similarity, is, or what is still around, which is similar to that? Well, again, it depends on whether you believe the natives. We've had good reason to be for believing the Congolese natives, though Carpus, Congo, Picos, and whatever. And the same Congolese natives say that in the Likuala swamplands, or what used to be the French Congo, hmm. there's a creature that they call them Achillean Bembu. They say it's about 30 feet long, it has a large elephantine body, a long neck, small head, a very long tail, four squat legs, and these three-toed footprints, which is basically the diagnostic description of a brontosaurus. Mm. Now, to, to us, that sounds fantastic, but mm. to them, they say, oh, you, you know, there are lions, there are crocodiles, there are tortoises, there are Machilian Bembis. It's nothing new. They've always known about it, they've hunted it, they've killed it. But to us, because the Likuala swamplands are virtually impenetrable, Western explorers have never been there mm. to, to any great extent, only literally touched the fringes. Um, if there's going to be a living dinosaur anywhere in the world, that's where it will be. And it's interesting to note that that is where they are being described. What, what's, what's been down to these areas that, that's preserved all these species for so long? Well, what's been special about them? The Congolese area, is, although it is part of Africa, it's almost an island in itself. It's surrounded on all sides by literally inaccessible, impenetrable regions that mm. animals simply don't m migrate through. Humans certainly don't. There are no white hunters and so forth, you know, charging through the Likuala swamplands. Hunters live within them, but not, on, not wandering backwards and forwards. So it's basically a very isolated community. Animals, the, the, the plants, a lot of the insects are unchanged for millions of years. It brings us on to, doesn't it, Carl? Things like the Yeti. Yeah. What do you think the Yeti is? Well, apparently the latest idea is that there's not a Yeti in terms of even a single species. There are three different types of Yeti, and remains have been found. As in yet, Yeti more. So I, 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 I mustn't keep throwing these That's punches. quite abominable. <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh. Snowman snow will, <laughs> snow will believe it. <laughs> the Yeti. Yeah, okay, moving swiftly on. Uh, yes, there are three types of <laughs> Yeti. <laughs> The, um, a small one, which could be a type of just pygmy people who live in the area. Mm. There is 
the true yeti, the meite, which is about five foot tall and could be a type of orangutan from the description, that lives at mo apparently most of the time in the forest area. It only comes into the, the winter um, snow-covered regions when it's starving during very, very severe winters. And that's when it's seen, that's when it leaves these large footprints. Right. And then there is a, a supposedly gigantic creature called the Nialmo, which is very similar to North America's Bigfoot, which you probably read about, this huge, mm. tall ape walking on its hind legs, le leaving these gigantic footprints. Again, you're talking about an area that few people have really been to. I mean, the mountaineers wandering up, back up and down, but actual scientific expeditions, uh, for the simple reason, it's a very difficult place to, to go through. And the animals, as quickly as you go into one end, they off the, the other. They know the right. area so well, they keep all away from people. It's a catch-22 situation, really. What's your favourite part of the world, then? I mean, we talked about the Yeti. For this type of thing, I think New Guinea. Uh, New mm. Guinea, I think, is quite a fabulous area for, for discoveries. I mean, in the book, there are several New Guinea animals that have, have turned up, and also several others that I think are very likely to turn up. And one, one of my own favourites is called the Devil Pig, which is about... Devil Pig? Yeah, that's, that's oh. the name, the Devil Pig. About five feet long, very long snout, black with faint markings over it, and mm. cloven um, feet. It sounds a little like those tapirs that you see in zoos, but they don't have cloven feet. But mm. there, were, there was an animal called a palachestid, or marsupial tapir, and that lived around 6,000 years ago and now there are sculptures found in New Guinea of this long snouted animal which goes only back about 8,000 years ago right. and now these animals have been reported in the Mount Albert Edward another very inaccessible region area mm. so perhaps they didn't even die out a thousand years ago perhaps they're still there today but they've never been properly looked for because, again, the terrain is very is difficult. Is your ambition to discover one, to actually I would be, certainly, the, be the I, first there? I would there. certainly like to, yes, but it really is like looking for, say, and moving needle in a haystack. It isn't, if, you know, the animals stay still. I mean, it's not like looking for an unusual plant or whatever. Mm. You know, as, as I say, as you go to one area, they go to somewhere else. It, it's a, a very chancy business. Almost all of these animals, you don't find the living animal. You find remains in native huts and things like right. that. You bring those back, they're identified. Then you basically, you get the finance to go and, and, and look for the and real then, thing. Yeah. Right. We'll talk about finance and, yeah. and the way that, that, that a very important the, part the of way that money is. can trample through everything yes. and beat sounds sometimes. After we've gone to Michael, who's on the line. Michael, good evening. Hello. Hello, Michael. Where are you? In Cambridge. How old are you, Michael? Eleven. Why are you doing up at this time, Michael? <laughs> yeah, I've got Tom Bowen here with me. you got what? I've got Tom Bowen with me, here with me. Oh, you've got a Tom Bowler. That's nice. We'll, we'll have a raffle later on. No, Tom Bower. Tom Bower? Tom Bowman. Bowman? Yeah. One of our researchers? Yeah. Are we sending out researchers into people's <laughs> houses now? Yeah. What would you like to ask, Michael? Would there, would there be enough food in the Loch Ness to feed these, the monsters? For these these amount, m many years, millions of years. There, right. Has there been enough food to keep a Loch Ness monster going? Yeah. Right. Well, there, there really are any any amount of food. I mean, fish in particular, eels, salmon, trout, that type of thing. People say, oh, well, it, it, it is. In one way, a sparse lock, it's not uh, absolutely abundant with food, mm. but um, most of these animals can eat a great variety of different things, and they certainly are. I mean, now we're getting the new information from the, the latest expedition to Loch Ness, which is deliberately not looking for the Loch Ness monster, it's looking literally for everything else. Right. And um, we're finding that there is a great deal of uh, food material in the biomass, so yeah, I mean, the Loch Ness monster could easily survive on what is there. Okay, Michael, thank you for your call. Okay, thank you. Thank you for your question. Cheerio now. Um, we talk about money. Can money sort of trample things? Because if, if, for instance, someone saw the Loch Ness Monster, then the pound signs come up mm. and everybody mm. comes out. The world mm. is Uncle mm. Bill chasing. Mm. Does that upset you? It depends. One thing that, that worries me about unknown animals is the very fact that they are technically non-existent there is nothing to protect them. They can be mm. shot, killed, exterminated. You know, you can't or, protect or, an animal. Or, or if you like, going back to the earlier days, trapped for zoos. Exactly. I but think. until you can actually prove that they exist, they are completely vulnerable. So in a sense, although, OK, you say about money talking, about people going off and doing what they can to find them, it's no bad thing because at least once they're found, the protection measures can then come into play. Such mm. as with the Vu Quang Ox, that's a good example. It couldn't be protected before. It didn't officially exist. Now they are conserving its, its um, habitat, its region, it's being a protected species and therefore we may finally save it from extinction. Let's go back to some pictures. We've got some, some other pictures for you. One is the, uh, the Peru's long-whiskered owlet. Now, this, this caused all sorts of problems for the scientific world, didn't it? It did, because frankly, although it didn't look that different from any 
a normal little owl, but in actual fact, anatomically, it's very different. And these facial whiskers are very new as far as owls are concerned. It's a really tiny little creature. It only weighs mm -hmm. about two ounces. Weeny tiny little creature found in Peru, 1976, and again in an area where all sorts of other new birds, a new parakeet was found, a new little thrush-like bird, which can't even be classified anatomically. It, it's a combination of about four or five different families, and it's a complete mystery. But the whole area now will be protected because of these animals having been found.